Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Andrew Schaefer, and I'm the Director of Development and Communications here at the GLBT Historical Society. I am here to introduce tonight's event um, and to moderate what's certain to be a lively and engaging conversation. But first, before we start, I want to acknowledge um, that the GLBT Historical Society is based on Ohlone tribal land. I invite any Indigenous folks with us to make themselves visible in the chat and to be recognized as we honor the contemporary and ancestral lives of America's Indigenous peoples. This event is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel and website. If you're watching with us live, we welcome, you, we welcome your active participation in the chat and encourage you to post comments, observations, and questions for the participants. Before we start tonight's program, I want to give a quick introduction to the Historical Society. Most of you probably are familiar with this, um, but I want to share a little bit about our work. Um, and so I'm going to pull up my screen. Hopefully this works. Hey, we did it. Uh, the GLBT Historical Society's mission is to collect, preserve, exhibit, and make accessible to the public materials and knowledge to support and promote understanding of LGBTQ history, culture, and arts in all their diversity. Basically, what that means is that we protect and share LGBTQ history and culture. Each year, we produce more than 40 public events just like this. We host more than 400 researchers in our archives, and we welcome more than 26,000 people from around the world to our museum in the Castro. Obviously, the last year or so has been a little bit different, but we look forward to hitting those numbers again soon. The core of our work is our archive, located at Sixth and Market in downtown San Francisco. We hold over a thousand individual collections, ranging from personal diaries and organizational papers to drag outfits and audiovisual documentation of decades of our history. I want to highlight just a few to give you a taste of our collections. These are some of my personal favorites. The top left is Jose Saria, the first openly LGBTQ candidate for public office in the US, founder of Imperial Court System, self-proclaimed Empress of San Francisco. We have thousands of documents, photos, costumes, and flyers that document his incredible life. Right next to Jose is Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin, who are, we'll hear more about in a moment, co-founders of the first lesbian rights organization in the US, the Daughters of Belitis, as well as founders of numerous other organizations. They were also the first same-sex couple legally married in San Francisco. And we hold over 200 boxes that document decades of activism and commu community building. Next to them is someone that's a little bit less known. Hiro Anuma was a gay Japanese man who was forcibly interned during World War II. His collection is really small, just two boxes, but it offers a rare glimpse at queer joy in relationships pre-World War II, including snapshots of his friends and lovers and sexual interests. On the bottom row, we start with Lou Sullivan, a gay and trans historian and community organizer who is a founder of both FTM International and a founding member of the GLBT Historical Society. Within his collection are more than 400 pieces of correspondence that show how he connected with people from around the world before email or Facebook or even Zoom and YouTube. And right up next to, to Lou is Gladys Bentley, an African-American queer performer active during the Harlem Renaissance who later located to Los Angeles. She publicly married a woman in 1931, um, 80 years or so before it was actually legal. Um, I like pairing her with uh, with Phyllis and Dell to show that even before the state recognized us, we were already doing the things we wanted to do. You can browse uh, these and more collections at our website, glbthistory.org slash archives. Now, archives aren't just passive. They don't just collect dust. We make them active through exhibitions. A few recent ones um, that have just gone up, the legendary is our most recent exhibition. It showcases the dynamic and diverse history of Bay Area Black LGBTQ lives, reflecting things of art, belonging, justice, and sexuality. This one, with one title on display for each letter of the alphabet, empowerment in print reflects queer people from a wide range of communities using periodicals to form social networks, create culture, express desire, and inspire activism. Lastly, Raining Queens is a collection of snapshots taken by photographer Roz Joseph of drag performers in the 1970s. If you're gonna watch RuPaul's Drag Race with you tonight, I'd strongly suggest starting here, getting a little sense of the history before RuPaul, before Gottmik, before any of them. You can see these and more exhibitions on our website, glbthistory.org slash exhibitions. And finally, we host events just like this throughout the year that connect past and present. Here are a few upcoming ones. I wanna give a special plug to our anniversary party and trivia night coming up on March 26th. If you think you know your stuff, come and prove it. Uh, it should be fun. We'll have some great prizes and you can learn more about our history. You can register for these and more events at glbthistory.org events. 
Finally, there's a few ways you can get involved. First, by becoming a member, you can get year-round access to our museum and events while helping us sustain and grow our collections. As a sustaining member, you also get free access to over a thousand museums across North America. I realize that's not a huge advantage right now, but as soon as we, they reopen, I guarantee that's gonna be a hot commodity. I know I'm excited to start visiting museums again soon. If you're not ready to become a member, you can also make a donation from $1 to $1,000 on our website at glbthistory.org slash donate. Every donation may, goes directly into helping us preserve and share LGBTQ history. And lastly, you can follow us on social media for more updates about our events, our work, as well as uh, tidbits from queer history. That's enough from me. I'm gonna start by introducing our fabulous speakers tonight. Up first is Jeffrey Harris, an independent historian and preservation consultant who works with historic preservation organizations, historic sites, nonprofit organizations, and academic institutions on preservation issues related to diversity and historic site interpretations. He was the first director for diversity at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and he was recently appointed to a four-year term on Virginia's Board of Historic Resources. He also currently serves as the board chair of the Rainbow Heritage Network, a national organization that seeks to preserve historic sites related to the history of the LGBTQ community. Our second speaker is Shane Watson, an architectural historian and preservation planner, and the founder of Watson Heritage Consulting, a Bay Area-based consultancy, consultancy for architectural history and historic preservation planning. She's the co-author, along with Donna Graves, of the Citywide Historic Context Statement for LGBTQ History in San Francisco and the San Francisco chapter of LGBTQ America, a nationwide history of LGBTQ communities in the United States, commissioned by the National Park Service. Shane is the founding chair of the GLBT Historical Society's working, Historic Places Working Group and was the co-chair, along with Executive Director Terry Beswick, of the Arts, Culture, and Heritage Committee for San Francisco's LGBTQ plus cultural heritage strategy that came out last year. That's entirely enough introductions. Uh, I think we can start um, by bringing our panelists onto the screen and I will stop. Thank you, Lee. Um, hi, Jeffrey. Hi, Shane. You gotta unmute yourself. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Free. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you both for joining us. I'm very excited to get into this. <clears throat> to get us started, I wanted to ask Shane, I know you've been working a lot on the Lion Martin House here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, so, what can you tell us about the house of history and what's happening currently? Sure. So, Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin, um, as everyone knows, uh, were pioneering lesbian activist couple. They met each other in Seattle in, I think around 1950. They were both working for trade magazines in um, uh, doing editing work, I believe. And they ended up falling in love. They moved back to San Francisco. They moved in together in a little flat on Castro Street, just one block up from Harvey Milk's future camera shop. Um, and residents. And then in 1955, they decided to move out and buy a house, purchase a house together. And so they bought this house uh, on a hill in Noe Valley that we now call the Lion Martin House. Um, it's a tiny house. It's about six, 756 square feet, uh, one bedroom, one bath, essentially a cottage. Um, they lived there from 1955 until Del Martin's death in 2008, and Phyllis Lyon lived there until she passed away last year in April. And the house is currently uh, going through the process of becoming a San Francisco landmark. Uh, yesterday, the no, on Wednesday, the Historic Preservation Commission heard the uh, proposed landmarking and voted to support the landmarking of the house, but. I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but they decided to, the house itself is on two, two legal parcels. So 649 and 651 Duncan Street. And 649 Duncan is essentially their yard. It's the side yard of their house. Their house is in the upper corner, upper right corner, and the, the rest of the yard comes down in an L shape. Um, they probably view, viewed it as a single lot the entire time they lived there, as did the previous owners. Um, that lot was removed from the landmarking, um, and we can talk about that later if people have questions. And the reason it was removed is the vote was six to one with 
uh, six of the commissioners voting to remove it so that the new home, new property owner can build on that side of the, the property. So essentially divide the two lots, build a new house, leave the Lion Martin house, um, you know, maybe with some restoration work done. We're not really sure yet. That's a ways down the road, but that's kind of the overview of the, the Lion Martin house. And as Andrew mentioned, the uh, Lion and Martin were co-founders with a couple other couples of the Daughters of Belitis, the nation's first lesbian rights organization. Um, and I just want to read a little snippet since this is Black History Month and Free is going to go into this a lot more than I am. But I did want to talk about how most people view the Daughters of Belitis as a, as a predominantly white and middle class organization. But, um, you know, somewhat surprisingly, women of color were part of the leadership and membership throughout the organization's history. So this is a little snippet from the San Francisco's LGBTQ historic context statement. The uh, 1956 articles, articles of incorporation for the Daughters of Belitis made sure to state that the the Daughters of Belitis welcomed all women, regardless of race, color, or creed. Um, or an early member named Billy Talmadge, who was African American, is quoted as saying, unlike many other groups in the 1950s, there were no color bars in DOB. There were not just African Americans, but Asians, Latinas, etc. The driving force was that we were gay women, period. Um, another early member who was African American was Pat Walker, who's who went by Debbie, and Debbie Walker was a blind African American woman who became president of the San Francisco chapter of Daughters of Belitis, Daughters of Belitis in 1960. So that's five years after the organization was founded. So that's pretty cool. And then Walker is quoted as saying, "I didn't think much about being black that much until it was brought up." I think that my being blind was more of an issue, period. Um, at that time, Walker said she, there was only one other black woman who was a member of the San Francisco chapter and her name was Cleo Bonner, who went by Glenn. Um, and Glenn Bonner went on to be elected as the Daughters of Belitis' national president from 1963 to 1966. She was the first African-American lesbian to lead a nationwide gay or lesbian rights organization. Um, and then all, almost all of this is coming from this really wonderful book by Marcia Gallo that everyone should read if they're interested in learning more about the Daughters of Bledis and Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin and all of these other many wonderful women. Um, she's, she's just a quick quote from her. She says, Bonner's assumption, this is Glenn Bonner, get Glenn Bonner, Bonner's assumption of the leadership of the daughters can be viewed as an organizational statement in favor of the larger issues of racial as well as, as, well as sexual equality. Um, so that, that's all I'm going to say for tonight on the Lion Martin House. We can talk about it later if people have questions, but I just want to also mention that there is a friends group called the Friends of Lion Martin House, and we formed this group in September of last year when we heard that the house had been sold after Phyllis Lyon's death. And um, we're starting to become concerned about potential redevelopment of the site. So we have about 220 people signed on to our letter so far. And we are going to be planning a community meeting in the next couple of weeks to talk about next steps um, leading up to the Board of Supervisors hearing for the landmark. So join us. Are you talking, Andrew? <laughs> we can't hear you. Oh no. What's up, Free? Not much. <laughs> Just sort of seeing where this is going to go. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay, all right. I was trying to fix a problem and created one instead. So, um, yeah, that happened. Um, thank, anyway, thank you for sharing that book. I definitely want to pick it up now. Um, and we don't, we're not sponsored, but I 
Um, I wanted to, uh, so Jane, you shared some of the history. Um, and there it is. So this is the, the website for these friends group up on the screen now. Um, and there is the letter there that people can sign, Jane. Yes, the letter is there. Link to the letter on the website. Perfect, as well as upcoming events and things. Um, so that's probably the best place to go for updates um, on the house in particular, which, you know, it seems like things are moving quickly, which is exciting. Yeah, things never move this quickly in preservation, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. Preservation's a slow business. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy. It's, except for demolition sometimes. It's yeah. slow and it's fast, yeah. That can happen quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, Shane, for, for sharing some of the history. Um, so Shane talked a little bit about some of the, the African-American history of Daughters of Belitis. Um, and Free, I know your, your focus is largely on like East Coast folks, um, but what can you tell us about some of the folks um, that you'd like to highlight tonight? Sure, I, I'm gonna say something that people who know me well are, are going to be shocked when I say it. I have a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> that goes along with what I'm about to say. And um, essentially, no as, as we can see, I, I've, I've joined into the, the zeitgeist with you know, African-American LGBTQ places matter, which they do. And it is, it's, it's just something that, that has come naturally to me. It really started more self-edification. Um, in terms of my my interests, you know, as an out gay man, you know, as an as an African American, so you know, over time, it seems as I got more involved in in preservation and more opportunities to not only learn more about African American LGBTQ historic places, but actually write about them and you know help people with the preservation process. It's really come up. So what I wanted to do tonight was really just highlight. A few key, you know, key to me, African American LGBTQ historic places, um, and some will have images of actual sites, and others will have images of individuals. So I'll begin with um, Elaine Locke, and I'm not sure if many people know who he is, but Elaine Locke was the first African American Rhodes Scholar in the nation. He was a philosophy professor at Howard University, and he is essentially the father of the Harlem Renaissance. Now, though he was Washington, D.C. based, he, he recognized that Harlem, New York, was essentially becoming a center of arts and, you know, the gatherings of people with a great deal of, you know, funding opportunities and sources. But Elaine Locke really is that key figure who sought out artists. He brought a lot of people like Langston Hughes and Zora, Neale, and Zora Neale Hurston from Washington to New York. Richard Bruce Nugent is another one, it's another figure. So he really was doing what he could in his way to combat the stereotypes that were building as Jim Crow was on the rise, you know, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And he really believed that we would be in a better position as African Americans to really show who we were through our artistic endeavors. So he is very central to that. Now his home, unfortunately, is not listed on the National Register for Historic Places. It's not the National Historic Landmark, considering how extremely important Elaine Locke is. And, you know, I'm sure that there are issues, there may be some issues regarding the homeowners, may not maybe not wanting that, or, you know, there's it, it can't be a matter of lack of research there's plenty of research about Locke, but it's some it's it's an historic place that really deserves a great deal more attention now one of his contemporaries and i'm not sure how he would have felt about uh, ma rainey but you all know a lot more about her now thanks to that wonderful um production of ma rainey's black bottom the august wilson play now oddly enough ma rainey's home in columbus georgia is actually, when it's safe, <laughs> to return open to the public. It's an, it's an actual museum that people can visit. Now, Ma Rainey is the mother of the blues. She is the one who discovered Bessie Smith. She is She also had the interesting distinction of being a, a bisexual woman who 
I, we could we wouldn't use the term out as we would today, but she didn't necessarily hide her interest and or her attractions. And she even included lyrics in her songs, you know, that made that very clear. So, you know, that's another place, but this home is actually listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And again, it is a museum that one can actually visit in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, next would be another contemporary would be the um, home of the late Madam C.J. Walker, Villa Lawaro. Now, the reason that it falls into the category of an LGBTQ historic place is because of Walker's daughter, Alelia Walker. Now, Lelia Walker, uh, following her mother's passing, more or less became one of those patrons that Elaine Locke would have been looking to, to help, you know, finance some of the, and help support some of the artists who were a part of the Holland Renaissance. And her being an heiress, and, and a rare African-American heiress at the time, she absolutely, she absolutely was able to do that. But Walker also happened to be a bisexual woman. So she was a part of the community. So she palled around with all the greats, you know, the Wallace Thurmans, the Langston Hughes, the Richard Bruce Nugents. She hung out with those folks and did what she had to do. There are interesting articles that I found, you know, during my historical research talking about how Langston Hughes and Alelia Walker would go to the various drag balls in Harlem and, and cut up in Kiki and have a great time. And Villa Luaro became one of those places of refuge for a lot of those African-American artists, you know, a little place outside of the city where they could, you know, be themselves, where they could, you know, have a, a good time and where, where you know, Alelia could be herself as well. Next on the list, and moving a little further in time, you know, we, we're we looking at sort of our civil rights generation um, individuals. And this is the childhood home of Polly Murray, who again is another figure that many, many more people should know who don't. And Polly is one of those individuals who is, has a little bit of everything you know, an attorney, a, you know, a worker rights activist, you know, a feminist, a, you know, just sort of, you know, became an Episcopal priest, you know, ended up with a, you know, earning a doctorate in jurisprudence at Yale. The thing that is so fascinating about Murray is that, you know, during, during the time that Murray was coming up, she ended up becoming the, and I'm going to make, and just to be clear, I'm going to be using the pronouns of she and her only because we're not really sure since, you know, the idea of using them and they are relatively new. I'm not sure that she would necessarily use them, though I though it is very clear that she was gender nonconforming and certainly fell within the category of a queer person, um, queer person of color specifically. But one of the things that Murray did that was particularly key was she coined the term Jane Crow. And she did that when she was at Howard University Law School to really focus on the double jeopardy that African-American women found themselves in having to deal with both sexism and racism simultaneously. And, that con and she also came up with the concept of looking at the idea of attacking um, the the whole specter of Jim Crow from the perspective of equal equal justice under law that ended up being used basically a decade after she finished law school to be a part of the Brown versus Board of Education case and one of her old professor Spotswood Rob Spotswood Robinson you know Howard University professor did give her credit for coming up with that it was it was a challenge that she had had she she bet him. <laughs> that Jim Crow would fall within 25 years of their conversation. She was in law school and it fell in roughly 10. So, you know, you have, you know, you have this really dynamic individual. Now Murray's home, the childhood home was chosen because I don't know if there was really a good, a good particular historic place. She did move around a great deal that could really fit, but this was a place that was most consistent for her as a place that's called, that she called home, and it is now an historic, a National Historic Landmark. 
And I'll wrap with sort of my example of sites with the much more well-known, much more uh, famous by now Bayard Rustin, um, whose New York residence is list was listed on the National Register in 2016, and who has a biopic in the making um, under the production company of Barack and Michelle Obama. So that is something that we can look forward to. Now, for those who who may not know, which would be surprising, Rustin famous pacifist, was one of the principal teachers of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, on the idea of nonviolent resistance. He did freedom rides before we knew what freedom rides were. You know, again, he was a pacifist, so he did not fight in World War II and, you know, paid a price there. He was relatively out for the time um, when he operated, and that was a bit of a challenge for the very religious focus civil rights movement. So the leaders had their issues and contentions with him. But the key thing that he is known for is being the point person that A. Philip Randolph, the famous labor leader from the 19, 1910s, 20s, 30s, and 40s, um, he was a point person that A. Philip Randolph um, decided was going to be able to get the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963 that Bayard Rustin could get it done. And Bayard Rustin did in fact do just that. He was able to get it done. He also was a contemporary of, of Pauli Murray. They were both in the Congress of Racial Equality together. So again, these are just five individuals who have historic places, four of which are listed as they should be, and one of which is not, unfortunately. So with that in mind, moving to the next slide, still odd to say that. <laughs> One of the things that I definitely am, am very focused on is really trying to think more in, the, in terms of the future. What are places that we're not necessarily thinking of right now that are potential you know, future African-American LGBTQ historic places? So when I think of that, I often think of individuals like you know, the poet Essex Hemphill, what's an historic place associated with him, you know, that could be, that could be landmarked at some point. You know, there's a filmmaker, Marlon Riggs, who did the very famous Tongues Untied documentary for PBS. There's also the late author, Elon Harris, who was known, you know, huge New York Times bestseller, his books, um, Invisible Life and Just As I Am, you just blew up the whole realm of how one, you know, self-published author who becomes New York Times bestseller, you know, and, and died, you know, early, unfortunately. What about, you know, any place that's associated with Angela Davis or Alice Walker? And then you have places like the Black AIDS Institute in Los Angeles or uh, the organization Us Helping Us in Washington, D.C., places that were organized more or less to help in the process when the HIV AIDS crisis came through to try to help, you know, the African American community begin the process of dealing with that, men particularly. And then, you know, you have the more famous because of the relatively recent documentary Jules Catch One, you know, club that's down there in Los Angeles as well, where there's been a great deal of attention for obvious reasons because of the greatness of Jules himself. But those are the types of places that there really should be hopefully a greater effort in really trying to figure out ways to identify historic places tied to African-American LGBTQ individuals. You know, what can we do? How can we get things teed up? Um, what sites that exist now that have an African-American LGBTQ story attached to them that we don't know about that, you know, historians like myself and preservationists and, and architects can go and find that information and update existing you know, places that are on various state, local, state, and national registers. And, you know, just to more or less conclude at this point, because I know that there's Q&A, you know, I, I really want as many of us as possible to really take the effort to look beyond sort of the classic Black History Month frame and recognize based on a lot of what Shane has mentioned and the people that I've mentioned that it, that we're talking about the broader realm of American history that these African-American LGBTQ figures are very much a part of, tied to 
linked with so that we have a better sense of, you know, sort of weaving a greater and more rich narrative that exists out there so that for those of us in the preservation world, when it's time for us to move toward the process of landmarking places, of identifying historic sites, we can tell that rich, varied story that exists within the realm of our history and really get at the heart of telling better stories and getting more people made more aware of the, the myriad of folk that exist out there who have helped move the country forward to move us toward the toward fulfilling the goal of you know becoming that more perfect union and with that i will be quiet thank you i i will hopefully not be quiet can you hear me we're working again yes okay good um now i'm nervous about it um thank you that was um uh, that was really beautiful. And I wanna highlight one um, one aspect that was sort of woven through your talk, but I um, just wanna make it really clear. You know, with Polly Murray, with Bayard Rustin, we're talking about um, LGBTQ people of color really at the forefront of massive important changes, um, setting the setting the, the road for um, for huge change. And I think that's an important point to, um, to nail down. And as we're thinking about other historic places to, to identify, um, so I have some questions because I love hearing you both talk um, and can probably be here all night um, somewhat selfishly, but I also do want to encourage folks who are watching um, to drop a comment. Um, if you're out watching on YouTube, drop a comment in there if you have a question, and then we will ask our esteemed panelists to weigh in. Um, but my first question is something you said uh, free, um, something, uh, <laughs> um, when a site is listed, what does that mean? Um, listed where, what does that process look like? Um, preservationists have our own language, um, but for any non-preservationist in the audience, what, is, what does a listed site mean? I'm actually going to cheat and get Shane to actually go through that process so I can drag her into this discussion because okay. she's actually gone much more recently through the process of landmarking something than I have. <laughs> what was that? No, I could not that easy. So, so we're talking about listing, right? Okay, thank you, Free. Sure, that was a beautiful presentation. Um, so we have several different options for listing sites in registers throughout the country. So. Let's just say San Francisco. San Francisco has a local landmarking list. So you can list, for example, we are designating, working on getting the Lion Martin House designated as a San Francisco landmark. So that's a local designation. So it's being listed locally. Uh, the state of California has the state historical, um, oh boy, it's the this, it's the state has its own listing. For some reason, I'm drawing a blank. Um, state Register of Historic Places, I think, or Historical Resources. That's right, California Register of Historical Resources. Um, so that you could list something at the state level. Um, and then of course, we have the National Register of Historic Places where you, uh, it, you know, it takes a little bit more work to get to that level, but you can uh, designate sites for local significance as opposed to state or national. Um, and, and then at the very top, we have the National Historic Landmark Program, which Free mentioned, but I didn't realize that Polly Murray House in HL is her childhood home. That's really interesting. Yep. Um, but you answered why I was going to ask why we usually don't do that. But now I understand there wasn't another, there wasn't a more appropriate site that reflects her history. Um, so the National Historic Landmark designation is like the very, very, the, the cream of the crop. There aren't that many designations throughout the country. Um, very, very hard to get a site listed as an NHL. So hope that and, is. And Stonewall Inn, for example, is an NHL. And the Henry Gerber House in Chicago, which is the home of the first um, gay civil rights organization, the Society for Human Rights, is also a National Historic Landmark out of Chicago. And that actual organization had an African-American male as its president in the 1920s, John T. Graves. So we don't know very much more about him. So even there, you have the very first, you know, LGBTQ organization, you know, rights organization, 
and it had an African American male president <laughs> at some point. It as a contemporary of you know someone like Elaine Locke and Alelia Walker and you know Ma Rainey. So all of these things were going were happening, you know, in the 1920s, which is really fascinating. See, I knew Shane could do that better than I could. Oh, you can do it. You just didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> there was a little of that too. <laughs> You're both fabulous. That was a that was a good tag team. We should mention that it's 9.30 for free. Did we mention that? That's true. Yeah. Um, yes. East Coast. Yeah, uh, sorry East for Coast making you late. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we owe you for staying up late with us, so thank you. Um, I have one more sort of broad preservation question before we get into like the specifics. Um, so I think uh, people often refer to something as historic and mean lots of different things, but for preservationists, there is a specific meaning. So if a preservationist calls something historic, what does that mean? For whoever wants to take that one, I would, I would, <laughs> I would jump in and, and say that that. Okay, this is this might seem unorthodox, but to me that seems somewhat subjective, and this is probably the historian in me thinking about that because you know because something can have architectural significance. That's one thing. So you know, it's a, it's a unique architectural, you know, structure, or it has you know, unique architectural features. But then you also have, you know, an historic place that's based on an individual, something that an individual has done or a particularly famous individual. You also have, you know, places that are historically relevant because of the events that have taken place there. You have cultural landscapes, you have, you know, historic communities. So it, it's a fairly, I believe, subjective term. And it's actually something that the broader preservation enterprise of preservation movement has been wrestling with in terms of trying to break out of sort of the old sort of traditional, you know, when you think of the historic aspects of the historic preservation movement, it really was sort of great white men and wealthy people and their homes and architectural beauty and all of that and now becoming much more of a, a holistic, more varied, more rich understanding of the historic importance of the various peoples, you know, regardless of class, regardless of race, regardless of orientation, gender, you know, who have made the United States great. So that's why I make the argument that it's subjective because there are certainly gonna be those who fall into the more traditional side. And then there are others like me who are like, you know, look to the history. <laughs> is it, you know, what's the history of the place? I don't care if it's, you know, if a great historic building or great historic person or a great historic community or a great historic landscape, you know, or, you know, whatever it is, if it's relatively important historically. And, you know, again, we can't save everything, but if it's historic and we can, you know, save it, landmark and preserve it in some way, then we should try. Beautiful, thank you. Um, and now for an easy question, hopefully. Um, Shane, this one's for you. I'm gonna toss it up here on the screen. Gary from Delaware wants to know, how do you pronounce this? Belitis, Belitis, what's it gonna be? This is the final answer. Belitis. Belitis? Okay, I've wondered that for a long time as well, because I've always heard no. it both ways. Belitis, Daughters of Belitis. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a really long week. Um, it's Belitis. And I think it's written in, I, I believe Marsha Gallo in her book, Different Daughters, says how to pronounce it. Um, but yeah, it's definitely Belitis. Uh, wow, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let the record show. No, it's 9.30 here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's after five o'clock here. We'll just leave it at that. Um, there's another question about their house in the chat. Um, they casually referred to their house as Hebromania Haven. Is this a casual joke or do they actually refer to it? I never heard that. That's fascinating. Habromania Haven. A fun name. Do they want to elaborate with that? What was the joke of, or yeah, I don't know. I've never heard that. that. I'm sorry. Well, maybe it's in the book. Um, another plug for, what was the name of the book? Different Daughters? Different daughters, there we go. I'll also give a plug for Jane Crow by Rosalind Rosenberg. I think that was the author, um, the book about Polly Murray. It's very long, but very good. Um, quite a life to, to summarize. Um, 
I had another sort of broad preservation question. And for you talked a little bit about some of the sites or sort of the way you're thinking about the history that's happening now or the history of its recent history and like, what are the sites that we should be on the lookout for preserving. Um, but I wonder if there's some other sites that you both want to talk about that you'd like this to preserve, either of your own personal history or just that are of you know cultural um, or national significance. I'm I'm going to be fascinated to see how we go about the process of the landmark the landmark realm for HIV for the HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, you know, it, it's you know, it, it's such a significant it's such a significant historical period, you know, obviously not that, that the whole thing is over, it's not, but that the concentrated period from, you know, roughly 1981 to about 1996, 97, you know, when you have so much happening, so many things going on, I and so many organizations being established, I'm, I'm really going to be fascinated to see how we go about the process of, of really sort of identifying. I mean, there, there's some easy ones. I've mentioned Black AIDS Institute you know, out of Los Angeles with Phil Wilson. And then there's, you know, obviously the Gaiman's Health Crisis um, in New York. So, you know, and there are other places. Uh, there's uh, Gaiman of African Descent in, in New York that really wanted to focus more specifically on the needs of African-American gay men. You know, us helping us in Washington, D.C., same thing. So I'm really, I'm really going to be fascinated to see how we begin that process. Also, I am, I'm really going to be interested to see how, and I say this because it's not going to be me. You know, I'm, I'm not doing all of this stuff. It, that's just not going to happen. But it will be fascinating to see how we handle the history of, of Black Pride in terms of historic preservation and how we do the one of the places uh, that's called Banneker Field in Washington, D.C. Um, which is the location of one of the early uh, Black Pride events in Washington, D.C., is already listed on the National Register of Historic Places for different reasons. And that's an example of a listed site that could have its narrative updated to include that African-American LGBTQ in, you know, added information. I mean, the first Black Pride event that I went to started off in the Washington Convention Center, which is now gone, but then we found ourselves over at Banneker Field. And, you know, I went there a few times. So it was always an interesting place. And knowing that they had been there prior to, you know, my return to D.C. in, in, the, in the mid 90s was interesting. So that's so those are two areas of interest that I'm, I'm really going to be fascinated in seeing how they're doing. That's more recent. It's more recent history. I mean, we're almost up to 50 years now, so that's that'll be very historic very soon. How dare you say that out loud? <laughs> not for yours, of course, not for yours. <laughs> um, we have many, more, many, many more decades to go. Um, <laughs> but Shane, I wanted to ask, I know you've literally written the book on um, historic places in San Francisco. Um, what are some of the, the places either here locally or um, outside of that that you think should be get another look at for, you know, local designation or even national designation? So Compton, Compton's Cafeteria, the site of the, you know, Compton's Cafeteria riot, uh, I think it was 1965, four years before Stonewall. Um, that is not a San Francisco landmark. So that's somewhat shocking to me it is it, the building itself is listed in the it's in the national register because it's a part of the uptown tenderloin national register historic district but that's all you know an architecture focus so my next big push is going to get compton's uh designated as a san francisco landmark i just can't believe it's not yet also my personal favorite is mona's 440 club on broad at 440 broadway in san francisco it is, uh, it opened in the 1930s. It was like the third iteration of Mona Sargent's uh, lesbian oriented bars. The, they, they were all in North Beach. Um, she was a straight woman who was just kind of a bohemian and was into this, into the, into the crowd and um, was also knew how to make, make a buck and knew that, 
<laughs> women needed a place to go. And so she created one. And so Mona's 440 Club was w what we what we think of as like the first lesbian sort of focused nightclub, maybe on the West Coast, definitely in San Francisco. So those are my. And, and Gladys Bentley. Yeah, that's right. Featured in, in Andrew's earlier presentation in an ad for Mona's 440 Club, by the way, performed there. Um, and it's interesting just thinking in terms of, of Gladys, how, you know, I first came across her name with a, a club that I can't remember the name of the club, but it was in Chicago. And then she shows up, you know, in, in Harlem. And then she ends up moving out west. And the last thing that I recall related to Gladys Bentley was, I believe it was an article in either Ebony Magazine or Jet Magazine, where she more or less kind of renounced her, her lesbian days, um, if you will, and then pass, you know, not too much longer thereafter that interview, if I recall correctly. So that's, it's, it's an interesting, hers is an interesting history. That's, 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 she's the subject <laughs> of somebody needs to do that, that research to really sort of go through um, her yeah. history and the communities, you know, she literally went from community to community. Those are, you know, LGBTQ and African-American communities that she really hit, you know, doing her thing. Yeah, we definitely need the Gladys Bentley documentary or biopic or, you know, mini series. Come on, HBO. You know, you've got the money. Um, they can definitely afford that. Um, I'll just give one plug for, I don't remember the exact address, but it's on Steiner, the home that Jose Saria lived when he declared himself empress. I just think if it's the imperial residence, it should have a landmark. Shane, not to give you homework, but can you can you do yeah. that one? Send me the address. Okay, I, I walk no. by it frequently and there's just nothing. It's just a residential building. Um, now I do have a, I have a quick question. I, um, Sylvester is native San Francisco, if I'm San Franciscan, if I'm not mistaken. Is there, I don't know where Sylvester last lived in San Francisco. And I don't know if there's been anything related to um, Sylvester's, you know, history that's tied to the preservation side. I think that would be an interesting, that's another interesting sort of recent history um, conversation to be had, particularly for the African-American LGBTQ community. That would be, that would be really fascinating. Yeah, Shane, do you know of any sweeps? I, I don't, I get not off the top of my head, but in the, if you go to our historic context statement, there you go. Good plug. Um, it's there's a there's a section on disco and Sylvester um, on page two hundred seventy three. If people are interested, and where can people find that? That is a, not an easy on, link on the internet. On the internet, if you Google yeah. <laughs> San Francisco LGBTQ context statement, there you go. You can find it on Google. And then you click several different links within that, you'll you'll get to the PDF. The city website, it's somewhat buried, but it is there and it's, I haven't read the whole thing yet. Um, it's on my nightstand. Uh, eventually I'll get through it all. Um, there's you, a, oh, I'm sorry. And, and just really quickly, even in, in the question that I had, it, it I feel like it adds weight to my point in some ways about wishing we could ask some of the people who are living that we know are, you know, relevant figures in LGBTQ history, you know, what sites do you feel are the ones that are most, would be most associated with you that we should, as preservationists, historians, you know, who should we, what site which should we be looking at for you? You know, which one do you want us to highlight that best represents the history that you've given, the historic, you know, things that you've done, you know, with regard to the community. So, you know, I jokingly refer to the idea of RuPaul is going to be one of those figures who's going, who should, should have at some point a national register property somewhere in there, should. The question is where, <laughs> where would that be? And that's a good question to ask, to ask RuPaul in some ways, 
you know, similarly with, with um, Alice Walker, you know, Alice Walker's still with us, Angela Davis is still with us. You know, for some of these individuals, I would love to know if I ever had a chance to sit with them, I would ask them. So I've asked other people, you know, what site <laughs> would you want to be the site that represents you if somebody goes through a landmarking process? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's so important. Um, it is much easier to ask in advance than to try and figure out after the fact. Um, or to deal with like, here's what's left. Um, and so these are the, this is the menu of options. Um, so I think that's a very useful frame to be thinking proactively um, of these are historic people. Um, yeah. Then do you want to jump in? Well, I was going to say, you know, just building on what Free just, just mentioned um, and, you know, getting back to the Lion Martin house, they, <laughs> Phyllis Lyon did not want her house to be landmark when she was alive. And so that's, I, kind of keep coming back to that in my mind it's you know we're kind of pushing for a landmark after her death because we want we want this place or you know we need this place to be able to highlight these women and serve as some sort of a memorial um but it's an interesting topic that if we asked phyllis lyon if she were still alive you know what what place would represent you as a landmark it just makes Kind of makes me think. Yeah, that's, that's a useful point. It, it, it's it's an interesting one, and the only reason that I say that is, in some ways, to deal with exactly that sort of issue. That if, in fact, we knew, you know, how many people who have you know designated spaces now would want them, <laughs> even though they're there. How many? You know, I always jokingly refer to historians as, you know, people who are paid to be nosy and then put your business out in the street. You know, <laughs> so like how many people would really have wanted that information about themselves out there, you know, way back in the day. But, you know, at the same time, we recognize that there there are instances where there are just larger forces and, and, and larger needs, you know, larger than what we individually um, represent. Yeah, some people represent more than just themselves, but really a movement and a community. And um, Phyllis and Dell definitely fall in that category of people who had an outsized impact. Um, and their home wasn't just their home, right? It was also a, an institution. It was where they would do much of their work and their organizing. Um, I think it's also important. Right, I just, there's a comment here that says, it's a bit like famous people who wanted their papers destroyed at their death. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Um, but we're glad it didn't happen. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. Yeah, save one copy to uh, for the archivists. And also just a quick plug for archiving. We, we do have a, an extensive collection and you can also make a, a note in your deed of gift that you don't want anyone to see it for 50 or 100 or 1,000 years, whatever your, whatever your wishes are. So don't burn your papers, just leave a note that says don't look at these for a while. And then everyone wins. There is one other question in the chat I want to bring up. Um, it's uh, back to our technical questions. Um, is there a specific process for updating an existing heritage site? I think for you had mentioned earlier that there's some some spaces that can be updated. Uh, what does that process look like? Um, usual. Well, the ones that I can think of, and this perhaps might be a cheat because I I am on the board of historic resources for the Commonwealth of Virginia, but. Um, it, it could just be a matter of bringing it to the attention of the of the record keepers in some respects and then finding uh, someone who can update the um, historic narrative or update the nomination itself to bring information up to date. And that happens often. I mean, if you look at a at, if you look at an historic site, say that's been listed on the National Register that, we later find is worthy of moving up in category to a national historic landmark, then you then you really do have to go back through and update that information to you know prove the point as to why we're we're doing this. And that can that can happen easily there. And also if, if it turns out that there's information that we find out in a in an in an historic place that actually isn't true <laughs> and you need to go back and correct that record. So it's a matter of correcting the record. Um, and I know that, I'm trying to think if there's anything on, on deck that I know of directly. 
here in Virginia that we need to do that. The problem with places we need to do that too, but I can't think of an example specifically right now off the top of my head that, that we're getting ready to do that with. Yeah, and Shane, you also talked about, um, like in the Tenderloin, for example, there's a, a district that's recognized, but then there's specific sites within that aren't yet landmarked. Um, what does that process look like for updating a district nomination to include, um, for example, Compton's? So in that case, I think we probably wouldn't want to update the entire district nomination. Uh, we would, so this is a great example. So Glide Memorial Church in the Tenderloin in San Francisco at 330 Ellis Street. I wrote the National Register nomination for it for the planning department. They had a grant from the National Park Service, an underrepresented minorities grant. Um, so Glide is already listed in the National Register in the Uptown Tenderloin Historic District. Um, but we filled out an entirely new nomination application and it was really just a, as simple as checking a box. The site is already in the National Register, but not for these reasons. And so we hardly talked about architecture at all and just went into great detail about Glide's really extraordinary history, early history of working with homophile groups to make progress towards LGBTQ and many, many other underrepresented minority groups, social, civil rights. Um, uh, Glide Church is going through a bit of a um, situation with the Methodist Church. I think they're actually trying to get it out of the Methodist Church, or they already have. So they have put put a hold on the National Register nomination. But it's at the state level. It's just waiting to be sent to Washington. We just need to convince Glide to let us move it forward. But um, yeah, it's it's not difficult at all to and. I mean, the funny thing I thought, Free, you were going to mention this, but the really, really early National Register nominations are like three pages. Yeah, yeah. that's true. <laughs> that is true. They are hilarious. They're just three pages. And okay, it's in. But but ours are, you know, can go 1,500. As, as I've struggled putting together historical narratives and making sure that the Chicago style is properly done, done for my citations. Um, yeah, to see yeah. some of those early nominations, you're like, really? <laughs> really, this is what you did? Uh, okay. Not fair. It's not fair. No, it's not fair. Except we have the internet and they didn't. That's true. I guess, you know, there are some advantages to living in the present. Um, I have one. Uh, this sort of brings up another sort of semi-technical question, but something that I think is probably of interest to folks if they have their own sites that are of interest um, or of importance either in their own life or, you know, free, you're talking about some of these sites that we need to identify now for future landmarking, what's the best way to start the process or start thinking about, I have this, this site, I think it's historic, I think it's important, I want it to be recognized. Um, what's step number one? Um, I'll say here in, here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, you would reach out to our Department of Historic Resources and bring it to the attention of um, they would bring it to the attention of the department, and the department would put you in touch with a person who may be in, for in the case here who would be in charge of whatever region of Virginia you happen to be in, so that they would direct you to that person, and more than likely a staff person would begin the process of of checking out the place that you're talking about to see if in fact, you know, it begin, it sort of meets sort of basic elements. And then thereafter, they would work with the person who is trying to get this off the ground running, you know, to sort of help guide them through the process. Usually they're really, the states can be, states can be really good about helping individuals go through that process and definitely good with helping consultants who are doing that type of work um, through that process. So, I hope that begins to help. And actually, I'm, I've got there's a particular there's a particular site here in the city I'm in in Hampton, Virginia, that I kind of want to poke a bear at. It's the home of Leonard Matlovich, <clears throat> who um, challenged the ban on gays serving in the military. The home that he was in when he started his process when he was stationed at Langley Air Force Base in Hampton, Virginia, 
is about two miles from where I'm sitting. And that to me, and I've already alerted the Department of Historic Resources, so they're aware um, of that. And there's even, you know, we're talking the Conduct and Unbecoming book by Randy Schiltz has the, you know, the actual address and goes through, you know, what happened. The home was shot up after the report came out in our local newspaper. So that is a home that I believe is of very significant historic import for the broader LGBTQ history. But I'm going to guess that the homeowner may not necessarily, A, won't know, and B, I'm not sure how that would be received you know, in terms of the, uh, in terms of that information. So that's a process that, that when things get a little more calm, because everybody's had to adjust to COVID things, that I know that the part, department is going to want to get more involved with, and I definitely want to help shepherd that process if I can, you know, as best I can. Because I, I, it's, you know, a significant LGBTQ um historic place in my hometown are you kidding me <laughs> you know that's that's amazing so if it's possible you know we'll see about that and you know maybe i get to come back you know years later and go hey let me tell you about this and go step by step so um in san francisco andrew if you wanted to, to for your house on schrader for example was it schrader it's not in there. It's right. It's right. Right next to the park. Um, Niner. Mm -hmm. Right, Alamo Square. So if if you go to so San Francisco has this really wonderful website operated by the city called the San Francisco San Francisco Property Information Map, and I put the link here if you want to display it. And so you can start there, and you click on that link, and there's a little box that pops up for address, and you can search for the address of the property. And so I always enter 440 Broadway, the site of Mona's, and um, there's a little tab that comes up. So this is the city's GIS map. And so all of the data that Donna Graves and I collected for the historic context statement went into this GIS map. And so every single parcel in the city has, uh, you know, all of this data attached to it. And so it's you can locate it through this property information map and that will tell you under the preservation tab on the website, if the building, for example, if it was mentioned in the historic context statement for LGBTQ history, and um, it should pop up as a little alert, like this property has been identified as potentially significant for this history um, and it sends up a little red flag for planners when someone proposes to demolish the building, for example. Um, but also the historic preservation team at the planning department is it's just a wonderful, wonderful group of people who are super helpful and it's broken down by quadrants in the city. And so you can, you know, contact any of them and they would be happy to talk to you about how to landmark your building. I am ashamed to know I did not know about this website. Um, I will, <laughs> okay. I should have. So this uh, is the even better part of this is the Every single parcel in the city that has been identified for LGBTQ associations has, is shaded in rainbow. And so if you zoom out and you look at the city, you know, in its entirety, it's covered in rainbow. <laughs> it just makes me so happy. <laughs> we should have made that the cover of this event or something. That would have been fun. Yeah. Uh, I think I, maybe I have seen you like bring that up at a, at a talk or something at some point. That sounds familiar. I just didn't know the link. That um, is amazing. I know. Can you get something like that in Virginia? No, if, if it is, somebody's hidden it from me. I don't know what that <laughs> is. But I am I am on on tap to do a an historic context study for LGBTQ historic places in Raleigh, North Carolina. I am going to keep that in mind. Great idea. I love that. That's exciting. That's news. It it is. It's also been delayed because of the pandemic. You know, it's just been, yeah. you know, you can't get into archives and, you know, I think they're slowly opening them up and I don't live in Raleigh. So, you know, it's travel, you know, it's just all the logistics, but I am beyond excited about doing that and, and making sure that it's as diverse as it can be. Is Raleigh known for LG and LGBTQ 
not not necessarily but the the city is has been very eager to to go down this path and i think following the lead of the national park services you know outreach and efforts to really you know showcase lgbtq history i think it's i think it's wonderful that the city has opted to to do that i really do that it's exciting that's great I believe there is an LGBTQ archive in Raleigh. I don't remember the name of it. Um, yeah, there you have equality. You have equality. North Carolina is there. They have their. Uh, there is an. There is an actual archives for the city of Raleigh, LGBTQ community, um, and I'm blanking on every name because I have a <laughs> file that's behind me <laughs> with this information, and I've had to sit it aside because I'm down there, you know, quite. Mm -hmm. So yes, but they have. They have some really good resources. And the thing that's gonna be interesting is because you often think of Raleigh along with Durham and Chapel Hill, the question that I have is, you know, how much cross current, you know, elements are, are, am I going to be dealing with among the three locales? And really trying to figure out the best way to make sure that I'm highlighting Raleigh, Raleigh specifically, so. Great. It's easy to get sucked into sort of bigger narratives. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the for, uh, even my preliminary research, it, immediately I started, see, you know, seeing stuff in Durham, stuff at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, you know, so it was, it, it just started right off there, but I kept finding myself trying to focus back, bring it back, you know, to the city of Raleigh itself. Absolutely. Is the city um, of Raleigh funding that work? Yes, they are. That's so wow. Cool. Or I should say, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, that is really exciting. I am mostly out of questions. I have one more, which you don't have to answer. Um, but it's, um, so I want to give a, a quick plug for anybody in the chat to get your questions in now, if you have any lingering um, curiosities. Um, but you both sort of talked about um, homeowners and getting homeowners involved in the listing process, the nomination process. Um, and there may be reasons why homeowners don't want to have it listed or don't want to be involved. Um, do you want to say anything about like the protections that it offers or why someone might not want their their home or their site listed um, or recognized? And you know, is that reasonable? Is that sort of misinformation? Um, any thoughts on that? Um, again, I think the, the reasons vary. Uh, an example that I can that I can cite really quickly is there's there is a place in Washington, D.C. that was called Knob Hill. It purportedly had been, at the time, I'd say around 2011, was the oldest continuously running African-American gay uh, bar night spot in the country. When Knob Hill closed, you know, there was this question once it was purchased by new owners who also kept it in the, in the sort of bar restaurant tradition you know, oh, you know, maybe we should begin the process of trying to landmark it. The new owners were approached and they were not interested in getting that designation. They were not interested in, in that. And it was, it was a bit of a loss because I think that the, city, the folks in the city at the time, it's Washington DC. So people are used to things, you know, sort of going through a landmarking process, but um, it is it is a shame. Um, it's a shame that that. Hold on a minute. We'll be right back, folks. Sorry about that. Um, the it's it's unfortunate that the new owners were not amenable to that, and they didn't necessarily, from what I recall, they didn't give a reason. They just weren't interested in that, in having that landmarking process, going through that process. Others, you know, may not be bothered. Some may not be interested in the history. Um, there are concerns about, you know, will it have valuation issues with the property? You know, there, again, there are a variety of, of reasons I've certainly heard over the years that I've been in preservation. I don't know if Shane's heard, you know, it's her own stories. So, 
I learned recently, I didn't know this, that in, so if you're nominating a property in San Francisco for landmark status, for local landmark status, um, the, the property owner can object. And so I'll back up and say, when you're nominating a property for the National Register, it, it won't go very far if the property owner is objecting the, to the nomination. For, for example, Glide Memorial Church, the owner of the property has said, stop. Um, or pause. So it's interesting that the uh, San Francisco Eagle in the South of Market neighborhood, which is now the Leather and LGBTQ Cultural District, the, the San Francisco Eagle Bar, a historic leather bar, opened in the 80s, I believe, it was recently initiated for landmark status by Supervisor Matt Haney. The owner, the reason they are going after landmark status is, I, is the building was up for sale last fall. So I know the owner is probably not supportive of the landmark nomination, but the bar owner is. So it's an interesting kind of conflict there. Um, and you know, when I approached Phyllis Lyon in 2011 and asked if I could nominate her home to the National Register, she said no. So yeah, property owner, property consent is a, is a pretty big deal. Um, and I'm really not sure why San Francisco allows you to move forward with the designation locally without owner, owner support. Yeah, that is really interesting. I, did, I didn't know that. Yeah. Let's, let's, we won't say anything because we don't want them to change the rules. No, just um, erase this part. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, well, thank you so much. I want to give um, one last chance for anybody to ask a question if it's in the comments um, or for Shane and free to make any last minute plugs. Um, any other books you want to recommend um, or sort of comments before we before we wrap up? I have one plug. So San Francisco only has four queer landmarks and our newest, most recent landmark is the Paper Doll in North Beach. I think it's 524 Union Street. The Paper Doll was what we consider like maybe one of San Francisco's earliest LGBTQ restaurants that also had a bar, but it was mostly a restaurant. So the owners of that space are very, very supportive of that history. Uh, they were the ones who sponsored the landmark nomination and had it moved forward. Um, but we just heard yesterday, I think, that the they've been held up by permitting and zoning issues, and they've been unable to find a tenant to go into the space. The, so the owners of the former Paper Doll are now looking for a new restaurateur to go in there and reopen what they hope to be another Paper Doll type type space. So just want to plug that if there are any, re any restaurateurs in the crowd who are looking to uh, reopen a queer, queer bar, restaurant. And I suppose I would be completely remiss if I didn't plug the book that I have a chapter in. Don't know what I was thinking, but the book is Identities in Place, Changing Labels in Intersectional Communities of LGBTQ and Two-Spirit Peoples in the United States, edited by Catherine Crawford Lackey and Megan Springate. And it is the book version of the National Park Service LGBTQ theme study. And here is the book itself. I hope you all can see that. I love that with the women's building on the front. Yep. So, and in this particular book, I am the last chapter. Saving the best for last. Uh, we'll have to, we should add that to our, uh, we have an online bookstore. Uh, we'll have to add that to our, to our collection. Um, thank you, this has been um, really informative. I've definitely learned a lot um, and love sort of learning with you all. Um, Thank you to everyone who joined us on the live stream. Um, one more quick plug to go to glbthistory.org. You can become a member, you can donate, you can see all of our exhibitions, um, all of our online events throughout the year. Um, so please check us out there, follow us on social media, um, give some love to Shane and Free. Um, they're both fabulous. Um, and Free, we will have to have you back on when you complete your uh, Raleigh study. I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing more about that. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to do this evening's event. Absolutely. Thank you, yeah. Andrew. Thank you, Lee. And it's great to see you again, Free, as always. You as well. All right. Um, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we will see you next time. <laughs>